I thought we should we would do this. First, I'll introduce all of the program officers representing the various funders working in this space. And then I'll moderate a discussion about what and how we can learn together as a funding community about the potential for behavioral economics inspired interventions to dramatically improve health. So their bios and descriptions of the organizations that they represent are very easily found on the web, so I'll just introduce them briefly so that you might match a name with the faces. First, we have Lynn Garner. She's a sociologist. She's also the trustee and president of the Donahue Foundation and oversees the programmatic direction of the foundation's grant programs, including several partnership programs such as this one. Jonathan King is a cognitive psychologist and a program director for the Cognitive Aging and Human Factors in the Division of Behavioral and Social Research, BSR, at the National Institute of Aging. While at BSR, he has coordinated the use of behavioral economic approaches, both to promote health behavior change in older adults and to increase the uptake of comparative effectiveness research. Leanna Chatrath, who has a background in political science and inter international affairs, is a program officer at the Rus Russell Sage Foundation. She runs the Behavioral Economics Program, which supports research that incorporates insight from psychology and other social sciences into the study of economic behavior and manages the activities of the Behavioral Economics Roundtable. Hal Sox is a physician and the director of the Portfolio Management Program and a program officer in the Comparative Effectiveness Program at the Patient-Centered Outcomes Research Institute, which we know as, uh, as PCORI. At PCORI, Dr. Sox's assignment includes research on decision making and chairing practice guideline panels for the American College of Physicians and the U.S. Preventative Services Task Force and the Medicare Coverage Advisory Committee. We have two leaders here today from the Commonwealth Fund, Anne-Marie Audet, who is also a physician and is Vice President for the Delivery System Reform and Breakthrough Opportunities Programs at the Commonwealth Fund. She oversees a portfolio of grants that includes the role of coordinated care systems that integrate clinical care, behavioral, and long-term and social services for high-cost complex populations, as well as a new portfolio of work on breakthrough opportunities. And Mark Zeza has a PhD in public policy and is Assistant Vice President for the Commonwealth Fund's Delivery System Reform and Cost Control Program. And this program supports the analysis and development of payment policy options that include incentives to improve the effectiveness and efficiency of healthcare delivery while curbing growth in healthcare, healthcare spending. And I'd now like to turn to each of the panelists to briefly describe how your organization has engaged with the field of behavioral economics to date and how you plan or predict that your organization will engage, explore, and or utilize these tools going forward. Okay, good morning everyone. Um, so um, the Donovan Foundation, let me take a step back and say that um, we are a funder of um, medical and health related research, but because of a particular purpose that we were given by our founder, we have a really keen interest in understanding how research knowledge can actually be put into application in you know, policy or clinical practice or uh, in a way that provides practical benefit to improve health, which is um, worthy. So without any um, disrespect to people that are doing research because it is a very um, difficult, challenging line of work, I often think that the actual application of that knowledge is at least equally as difficult. So we do spend a lot of time in really trying to understand what are the best ways to do that. And it was through one of our convening functions we um, sponsored conferences uh, for seven years to really focus on different ways to think about this, that we became interested in behavioral economics as a way of really understanding, um, okay, we've got this great body of knowledge about health improvement on an individual basis, uh, how we can prevent disease, how people can improve their health. But the challenge, of course, is to get anybody to actually do those things. So that's how we became interested in the field of um, behavioral economics and health formation. And then um, uh, through other activities we had had with Lori and other staff at um, RUJ, came into contact with this really great program. So 
But that was the lens through which we um, became interested in this. And um, uh, we do a, a number of other things. We have uh, to really think about um, knowledge is put in and thinking about choosing wisely. We have a staff member who has started a coalition um, in Connecticut uh, based on choosing wisely, trying to get a number of significant players. So our, our health exchange is involved in this, the Connecticut Business Group on Health, a couple other funders, and primary care um, association, along with a few others is working together to figure out how some of the lessons from that can be put into um, action and perhaps some of the behavioral economics techniques might be helpful there too. Um, our trajectory will be um, that we're very open to behavioral economics as a method and as um, a theory. Uh, I don't think that in the short term we will have a program that's explicitly devoted to it, but certainly within our um, funding opportunity, um, it's something that we would always accept and wouldn't um, prohibit those types of applications. Um, and in um, many of the other works that we do, again, in really trying to understand how research knowledge can be put into practice, I think that it's um, a really helpful opportunity to also. Hi, thanks. Um, as I introduced, uh, I'm from the National Institute on Aging. Uh, and which is one of the institutes, the National Institutes of Health. And I point that out because the uh, National Institute on Aging is a little different from most of the institutes of science at NIH that we're not focused on a specific disease process or a specific organ. So we're not NHLBI, which is part of blood, we're not cancer, et cetera, et cetera. Instead, what we have been given the mission of is to help uh, to fund research that will um, promote the health and well-being of older Americans. And when you look at whether things will tend to uh, um, get in the way of those things, what they have been is they tend to be the chronic conditions that we start to see pop up, at least in middle age, and then sort of continue through. Uh, and so for quite a long time, it's been fairly obvious to us that one of the things that we should be very interested in is sort of finding ways to allow uh, people to um, change their health behaviors in the way that they would really like to do if they could. And Matt Raven was pointing out that that's how it was necessarily, you can't take that at face value perhaps, but truly in some cases for things like smoking cessation, other sudden things like this, people are fairly, would be committed to doing these things. Um, and so one of the miracles um, that are funding, and one of the things I think I'd like to encourage people to submit more applications to us, is that although it's clear that the Evo economics has a lot of potential uh, to sort of allow us to produce uh, better strategies, better behavior change regimens, and better incentives for, for change, um, a lot of the work has you know, still been sort of based on sort of the generic adult, uh, for, for one better word, or in some cases, a generic adolescent. Uh, and we know from a, a large chunk of the literature in cognitive aging, I am the program for that, that age related changes in cognition probably do have an effect on some of the uh, some of the things that we've been discussing here again today. The one thing I'll very briefly describe is uh, since there's been a lot of work actually about uh, we talk about commitment contracts and the like, is that we do actually have evidence that's not replicated that some of these uh, many older adults are going to be less susceptible to these sorts of things. And the reason why is because if you want to sort of re-describe the situation, those to some degree, sometimes uh, rely on some cost reason of various kinds. So if I put $500 into the account, I want that $500 back. Uh, but it turns out that's not, only, that's not an aging variant thing. Uh, and older adults turn out to be less susceptible to some cost reasoning, which is, of course, you should consider normally not thing to do. They'll say, oh, what the hell, you know, that's water in the bridge. Where's the game? <laughs> <laughs> and more. Uh, and, but this is interesting because, you know, once you know these sorts of things, then you can sort of figure out how that re relates back to other uh, phenomena of cognitive aging and say, well, so that may not be the most promising approach, or maybe it will be in some cases, what could be used to replace it? You know, how could we uh, make some of these techniques be more um, responsive to change the lifespan? In terms of what NIA is funded, we have funded uh, a lot of things. Um, I'd like to point out that some of the things we're proudest of are actually our local translational centers which uh, uh, Kevin Bolt and David Lavison both have one, uh, which are clearly uh, using behavioral economics to promote savings and health behaviors, generally. And a lot of the work that we've come out of those centers as pilots has gone on to be funded, grant funded, not just by NIA, but other institutional centers. And so we're really 
having the way that that's been evolving. Uh, one of the things that was mentioned, so I'll mention briefly, is uh, by the next time this meeting occurs, you'll hear to know a lot more about it, uh, is that we had an opportunity with, uh, with the, uh, the, the DARA funding to fund uh, some, well, two in particular, very large uh, clinical trials, RCTs, to try to figure out what we could do to use behavioral economics to nudge the implementation of competitive effectiveness research. So some of the presentations we've seen today have been about health providers and their behaviors, and you know, in part it is they may be in some cases. Why do they continue to uh, prescribe antibiotics? I'll let you tell us about that in a minute. But then also, um, uh, for example, uh, you know, what kind of incentive structure would be best, uh, would most, um, uh, promote physicians and uh, their patients to, uh, you know, uh, sorry, to be here to look at lowering uh, medications and actually uh, achieve the results that we want. Anyway, the results of those two large trials are over, are apparently going to be appearing at some point pretty soon. Uh, and this is interesting because I think this is one of, this will be the first sort of, you know, at each scale in the U.S. sort of healthcare system. Uh, kind of results of how you know how these things will work, and uh, if they are seen as successful, if they do seem to be, are seen as being promising, uh, that'll be great because I think it will actually dramatically widen the opportunities for many of the other kinds of things that people have been doing here, and we're looking forward to that. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so just to give you a little bit of context, the Russell Foundation is the uh, primary American foundation devoted exclusively to research and social sciences. And our mission is to improve the social and living conditions in the United States. Um, and in terms of economics, one of our claims of fame would be that we had somewhat of a hand in uh, starting the field and that uh, back in the 80s, uh, we provided uh, some uh, funding to Richard Thaler to go uh, study with uh, Ben and um, and kind of get everything started back then. Um, our Programs been uh, running the economics research ever since the 80s, so uh, it's been um, around for a long time, and it has somewhat of a unique structure compared to some of our uh, programs. Is that um, we set up a roundtable that channeled uh, through which we channeled our funding for people economics, and uh, they devoted most of their resources to a couple of activities. Uh, which was really meant to get the field started back then, um, but it's still very uh, successful today in that uh, we had a small grant program for graduate students or recent, uh, recent graduates um, who helped them with uh, funding to, for lab experiments and so on to get them started. Um, and we still run that today as well. And uh, just let you know, by small and very small, the lifetime limit for you was uh, our 7,500. So, uh, but it's just a topic, subject fees, and, uh, and things like that. And the other, um, uh, the, the that we've been sponsoring for the last uh, 20 years is a uh, two-week um, summer institute crash course in economics. Again, for graduate students interested in economics or uh, junior faculty. And um, it's been very successful. We
but also from other social sciences, uh, trying to kind of cut across our programs and help you know, not to inform uh, social inequality issues or uh, labor market issues. Well, I, I'm imagining most of you would like to know whether Bakori might fund their research, so I'm going to try to give you a context in which to answer that question for yourself. Uh, Bakori was created by the Affordable Care Act. Uh, its mission was to help uh, stakeholders, both probably particularly patients and health care providers, uh, to make better decisions about the choices that they were actually facing uh, in day-to-day -day patient care. Uh, it's a not-for-profit, public-private organization. It has a board of governors. Uh, it's funded by a trust fund that is uh, the result of taxing each uh, Medicare uh, $2 for each covered life and also commercial firms. Uh, in the same way. Uh, the Corey gets about 80% of the proceeds from that tax. ARC gets 16%, uh, and their mission basically is to help with implementation and with developing the workforce for doing comparative effectiveness research. And the Corey's role is to fund research. Um, we have uh, programs uh, that uh, fall into five categories, which include uh, comparative effectiveness research, which is uh, the largest, but also reducing disparities, uh, methods, uh, methods for uh, communication and dissemination of research <coughs> results, and improving health systems, which overlap somewhat uh, with our, as I think uh, Bob Kaplan mentioned yesterday. The type of research that we Fund is head-to-head -head comparisons of the types of interventions that uh, patients and, and uh, physicians are using in practice. Um, so we don't really fund novel, untested results against a placebo or some comparator. Um, we've had our funding results go something like this. We started out doing investigator-initiated research, mainly because it was easy, relatively easy to get that going quickly. Uh, of course, as you know, started in September of 2010. And so far, we've uh, funded uh, 225 grants, uh, most of uh, with an average level of $1.5 million per grant. Uh, we funded a few what we call targeted uh, projects, which are uh, at, a, at a rate of about 21 million per, there have been five of those at a rate of about 21 million. Things like interventions for falls, for asthma, for obesity, kind of really big uh, targets of opportunity. Uh, the program that I personally think is the heart of the program is our large pragmatic studies program, uh, which consists mostly of pragmatic trials. Uh, by the end of the coming year, that is 2015, we will have funded 30 of these at $10 million a pop. So we're going to have an enormous program of, 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 of pragmatic trials. And they will be addressing questions that are actually identified by stakeholders through our advisory panel uh, uh, system. In fact, as long as we're talking about stakeholders, it's important for researchers to know that stakeholders are a big part of research funded by Corey. At the program level, they help us to define the most important research questions uh, to spend the public's money on. And at the research project level, they are supposed to be active participants in the development of the research and the outcomes should be patient-centered outcomes. So I think we're, as far as I know, we haven't funded any specifically behavioral economics or research project, but we're open to it subject to the constraints that we uh, fund head-to-head uh, -head comparisons of, of, of interventions. 
So uh, let me talk to you a little bit about how um, the Commonwealth Fund, there's two programs that the Commonwealth Fund that is probably related to some of your interests. And I thought what I would do is uh, lay out a little bit of the logic model for our strategies in these two programs, and then Mark can go into the, the one that's more related to behavioral economics. So the two programs are our delivery system reform program and our new breakthrough opportunities program. The delivery system reform is currently where uh, we have a um, population focus. Our, our strategy there uh, to foster a high performance health system is to target uh, really those that have high, co high need and high cost, really complex populations that have clinical complexity as well as social complexity behavioral and cognitive issues, uh, and also the low-income population. So that's our population, and we're looking for interventions, innovations um, in the delivery system uh, approaches, as well as the payment support to foster the sustainability of those models uh, to, to achieve the high performance. Our Breakthrough Opportunities Program is a relatively new program that's quite exciting, and I will really, uh, since this is to um, spark collaboration and ideas uh, among funders and among yourselves, um, I will uh, challenge you with uh, helping us figure out uh, this, this idea. Our notion of breakthrough, and we call it breakthrough opportunities, not breakthrough innovations. We're not really focused on innovations per se, since that's what we do in other programmatic areas. We have set the bar really high for what we call breakthroughs, and our definition of breakthrough is um, a um, something, <laughs> it could be a concept, it could be a bundle of innovations that are synergistically uh, act together to reach great impact, large populations, societal. So uh, there, yeah, when uh, I heard you talk today and yesterday, really we're looking, typically innovations target really narrow populations and reach impact in those populations, population diabetic patients or ICD patients. Mm -hmm we're looking for societal impact. So it's clear that not one innovation per se will reach that very good impact. So we're trying to figure a way of uh, approaching how we reach breakthrough, how do we find breakthrough, an inductive approach of scanning for concepts, ideas, or more a uh, deductive approach of looking at individual components and perhaps bundling them together to reach that great and doing some modeling to see whether we could reach greater impact the societal level. And our impact is 20, you know, we have a 2020 rule, it's just out there to be challenged, but to signal that we're looking for high uh, transformative uh, ideas of 20% reduction in cost and, and or improvement in outcomes. So with that context, we right now have two great concepts that we put on the table to begin our work. One of them is um, engaging consumers uh, to uh, using health information technology. So getting an activated citizenry that could really disrupt the healthcare system since we know disruption will come from outside, not likely from inside. And our second is uh, what we call incentives 2.0, and that's relevant to our discussion today, which is our logic model is that uh, all the, there's billions of decisions that are made every day by physicians, providers, healthcare, uh, social workers, a lot of service providers and consumers. And all those billions of decisions rolled up to our national expenditures in uh, healthcare services as well as in, in outcomes. How can we affect those decisions? So what are the drivers of those decisions? So we thought that uh, we would start to look at what we call incentives 2.0 and Mark will describe that um, in more depth. So, uh Again, we're saying we have this new program called Incentives 2.0, and, and by the way, we're also taking suggestions on how to improve that name. Uh, <laughs> yes, <laughs> and, uh, but basically, uh, the idea is that Incentives 1.0, paper for performance, uh, you know, hasn't really worked out so well. Many evaluations you know, keep concluding results are mixed. So our notion was, well, you know, as we move forward and you know, thinking about what types of grants we want. Uh, 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 fund over the next few years, uh, you know, how can we improve paper performance and payment reform uh, within the healthcare system, so hence incentives 2.0. Um, and, you and, you know, one of the first things, you know, we all thought about as well, you know, maybe uh, the design of the financial incentive systems are too basic, too naive, they don't take advantage of what we've been learning from 
social economy, psychology, and behavioral economics. So how can we bring in the principles from behavioral economics to improve the design of financial incentives, make them more motivating, more salient, and more meaningful to frontline providers? Um, and then going beyond just financial incentives, you know, what types of non-financial influences or uh, non-financial motivations, whether extrinsic or intrinsic, can, can we c combine with those financial incentives to really you know, ensure that we're getting the greatest impact from these initiatives? And that can also include uh, you know, even just thinking about the context in which uh, these frontline providers are, are delivering care. How can we make sure that context, that environment, you know, makes it easier for them to, to make the decisions that will help achieve whatever the, the goals are of the payment reform initiatives? So it's a pretty uh, a, a broad scope uh, for what's kind of a modestly sized uh, program at the Commonwealth Fund. Um, and but you know, we, so it's fairly new. And um, you know, in, the, in this first year, we've been working with uh, folks like Ken and uh, Zeke to kind of you know lay out the issues and. and, and uh, help develop a, a research agenda so that we can move forward to really start to systematically evaluate you know, what the best practices are, uh, you know, identify best practices from those that you know, haven't been working so well so we don't just keep repeating uh, the same types of financial incentive programs that, that you know, result in mixed results. Um, and you know, and we, in the future, we, we want to, uh, uh, as we move forward, we want to you know, fund uh, you know, more experience, uh, and you know, start pilot testing uh, new innovative approaches to these payment reform designs, so that we can you know eventually come up with a a playbook that we can to hand to payers and, and delivery system leaders. You know that that have a bunch of options that they can see. Well, for this type of context, you know, for a hospital that is participating in a bubble payment program that has you know salary uh, employees. These types of uh, incentives have, you know, worked pretty well, and you know, we can combine them with these uh, non-financial influences, and we might want to change our organizational structure in these ways. Maybe change our step, the way we schedule things so that physicians aren't as fatigued anymore, or nurses aren't as fatigued. So, you know, what, you know, basically our goal is, you know, within uh, you know, the next couple of years to put together a pretty comprehensive playbook. That can be helped. Uh, that can be used to, to achieve these, you know, breakthrough type uh, results. So I'm going to ask a series of questions, and I'm going to let you pick which of them you would like to answer from your perspective. And you don't all have to answer all of them, and we can do them in, in whatever order um, you get the, the feeling. Um, so for those of you who've done work in behavioral economics, what's your favorite example of when you expected behavioral economics to work? and the study just didn't yield the results that you expected, including those that didn't work? And or you can answer for perhaps everyone. What do you do or what does your organization do with unexpected findings? How do you think about failure and your role in learning and sharing with failure? And what uh, you could also answer, what could we do as a funding community to reward those who share openly in a way that allows us to learn from failure? In terms of findings, I can say that uh, we had experience with studies where we expected the findings to be one way and it went another way and that was something that was pretty significant. So I'm just going to take a bit of a, of a um, detour from this question. What I think um, that we have learned and that we, we knew and our experience is really reinforced is that um, the way we structure our funding is not necessarily compatible with some of the challenges of doing this kind of work, particularly when it's outside the lab, when it's really put in um, natural settings. Because often you're working with organizations where research is very low on their priority, even if they said that they're willing to do it. Um, and there's just so <coughs> much friction that um, we have to relax some of our um, ways that normally we, we do our work. And there are challenges with that because we have our own uh, um, constraints on how much money we get out each year and you know, all those kinds of things. But um, I would say, uh, it, again, not so much on negative findings, but the real challenges of doing larger, more innovative, more uh, real-life 
experimentation in this field is something that we're grappling with and trying to figure out how we can be um, a really good part of that. First of all, we ought to try to prevent failure. And um, anybody who gets a grant from us has got to fulfill our methodology standards, which have been worked out by a distinguished methodology uh, committee. Um, and uh, in addition, for uh, large trials, we will be actually subjecting uh, studies that have a relatively high priority uh, to a methodology review, which is not unlike the type of uh, SAP review that we did at Panels of Internal Medicine. Um, the law tells us what we have to do with our studies. Um, we have to subject them to a, uh, a, a review about adherence to our methodology standards and other standards of good uh, trial conduct. And, uh, and then we have to publish them within 90 days of the completion of the study and the completion of the review. And uh, that, of course, everybody who knows journals at all, that sounds impossible. Uh, but we have a proposal for how to do that that has been out for public comment and reviewed a lot with journals. And we think we've, think we've got a good way to solve that problem. So basically, uh, and, and the final thing that we would do would be we would publish the final report of the study on our website, regardless of whether journals decide to publish it or not. So there will be a public record of, of um, uh, of studies, even the failed studies. And I guess the last point still is that we require studies uh, to register with clinical trials. So again, there's going to be a public record of all the studies to start, whether they succeed, whether they're positive, negative, or inconclusive. But to be honest, the NIH has gotten acutely aware of what to do or what we should be doing better uh, with the results of studies that don't work out as expected. And this is true across the board. Uh, I'd just like to make a couple of comments about the kinds of things that we're going to be seeing, I think, more, you know, in, in the near future, uh, maybe on economics, which is to say actual RCTs at a reasonable scale, where the uh, trials themselves should be and will be um, actually registered at clinicaltrials.gov, and for which the NIH is uh, uh, going to be soon requesting comments and then eventually implementing strategies to make sure that things that are registered in clinical trials that are actually do see the light of the day. And sort of a discouraging thing in that you actually look at the statistics of them uh, and the number of trials that are actually registered in clinical trials that are actually conducted, are completed, you can tell that they'll be engaged up and rolling, and then are published on a timely basis is, is much smaller, I don't want to scare people, than you'd like. And that's a problem. Uh, and some of the things that we've been thinking about in terms of uh, either the public enhancing the applicability of uh, existing research, but then also uh, making sure that uh, failures are okay to those find findings, uh, expected findings, uh, get published. We have been uh, recently at work at that, and uh, one of the grants we just funded, uh, one of our so-called uh, networking opportunities, uh, was uh, our 24 grants to Brian Nusek, who is the Center for Open Science where he's actually going to be starting to implement, and actually has already started implementing in journals in particular, some of the procedures that we think will actually sort of enhance the ability for the literature to see uh, null results. And then in some cases, particularly for another kind of trial registration, where you'll be able to register, pre-register trials with journals that will be reviewed before you collect the data, before you do the analysis, with an understanding that if it passes peer review and the methodological rigor that's uh, you know, sort of required in a lot by that journal at that point, then assuming that you actually uphold your end of the deal and actually conduct the trial according to those, um, the, according to that, those rules, that it will be published yeah. by that journal. And so I think that's actually, we haven't had any of those happen yet, but uh, I think it will be something we should see in the future. And it's really sort of interesting because one of the funny things that we know about is that if the trial is large enough, it'll get published. You know, if you have if you involve fifty thousand people, it'll appear somewhere. Um, but unfortunately, where we have not seen this uh, this wide dissemination is for trials that you know uh, that are important that are importantly well powered enough. You know, didn't cost millions and millions of dollars, but would have you know 
either prevented us from making a mistake in funding something that's not likely to work, or would have motivated a different approach, you know, had we only known about it. And so that's that's definitely going to be a problem.